everyone and be very welcome uh, to this uh, interview. My name is Marco Serrato and I serve as Executive Director uh, for Executive Education at Monterrey Tech in Mexico. I also serve as a member of the Board of Directors at uh, Unicon and we are very pleased to welcome all of you to this uh, brief interview that we will have with Anton Fishman on the topic of uh, artificial intelligence on executive education. Before I introduce uh, Anton, I would like to share a little bit about his uh, uh, professional career. Anton has more than 30 years of experience working with uh, different businesses to clarify direction, determine what needs to be done, and ensure that they have the capability and capacity to make it happen. Nowadays, uh, Anton works as an educator precisely in the field of, in the, on the field of artificial intelligence and the future of work. He works with several different organizations worldwide as a trainer and uh, as a speaker and as a consultant on uh, ha uh, holding, holding strategic conversations and supporting long-term decisions for several different organizations in this field. field. So our, we are very happy to have Anton on this interview. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Anton. I'm delighted to do so and looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Anton. So uh, if we can go uh, straight into the topic and if you allow me to, to, to share an introductory question, for those of us that are not quite related with the topic, uh, what is artificial intelligence? We hear a lot uh, uh, about it nowadays. Uh, how would you define artificial intelligence? What is it? Uh, well, Marco, let me uh, start off by saying uh, what it isn't, because I think in the general imagination um, that there are a few um, things that probably people have picked up from films and, and, and books. So for, to begin with, artificial intelligence is not about the Terminator that they've seen uh, on films. It's not about robots. Uh, artificial intelligence as it uh, exists today is in fact an ecosystem of, of many different technologies that are maturing rapidly and coming together and interacting in a way that, that um, is both exciting, has real relevance for the business, and unlike a lot of the advances that were being made step by step in these fields over really the last 30 or 40 years, all of a sudden they have got power and relevance and are coming out of the academic and research laboratories and are being applied uh, in the daily experience of so many people and in the way in which businesses themselves are building them into services, building them into the operating models that they have, or at least starting to anticipate how these powerful technologies are going to change them and the world around them. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Anton. While, while I hear you, one of the questions that, 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 that comes to my mind uh, is, uh, uh, given all of these new technologies, what is, what is, what is the role, the, the, the present, and obviously more important, the future role that artificial intelligence is, 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 is playing on organizations? I know that the answer is quite wide because it, it is going to impact several different industries and sectors, but uh, what will be an overall, an overall view on this sense, and especially starting to, to place a seat on, on, on executives and executive development on an overall basis? What, what is the impact that it is going to have on organizations? Right. Um, at the simplest level, um, it's going to change everything. At a more specific level, I, let me just run through some of the areas that it, it is already beginning to make progress on. But also, I think it's helpful to, to understand its limitations, which are perhaps greater than, than, than some of the headlines might suggest. Um, to begin with, um, we have got um, what is called narrow AI, as opposed to general AI, which is the... the the intelligence of a computer that would be as good as or better than humanity. We are getting many, many little examples of, of um, artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence being applied in very narrow but very, very helpful fields. And these include um, machine vision, where um, uh, machine learning is being, in, is being connected to cameras so that these smart systems can look at the world, can see what's going on, can comprehend, analyze, and make decisions about that. 
Now, in practice, this is being demonstrated in medicine with uh, machine learning interpreting um, uh, x-rays and um, uh, looking at images at the back of the eyes to, to look for, for uh, impending blindness on the one hand. Um, this is being built into autonomous vehicles uh, as the vehicles look around and sense where they're going and have a great sense of the environment. Um, it is being um, built into um, surveillance systems, uh, which is sometimes being called today the Internet of Eyes where we are not only being watched as we uh, walk around, but are being identified. And some of these are, of course, benign and interesting, like Amazon's latest experiment of creating a, a, a shop, a supermarket, with no one working in there, but you go in and the cameras follow you, watch you, and see what you pick up and put in your basket, and you go out. And it knows what you've bought, and it knows who you are, and it knows what your bank account is, and it takes the money out. Uh, however, we also have um, uh, surveillance systems from the police uh, and others, and very potent examples are taking place in China at the moment, where something like 400 million people are currently being tracked every day as they move around cities. Um, the benign interpretation is we have what are called smart cities, the automation of entire city environments as they watch where vehicles go, they watch where pedestrians go, uh, they can see what's going on, they understand where there is congestion, where there may be um, challenges and, 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 and difficulties around moving transport around, but also in the same way they can also track uh, anyone's uh, place in that, um, in that city and act accordingly. Uh, within the, the, the field of, of visual imagery, of course, we have the simple but powerful visual search that the likes of Google and Apple have built in to, to, to their phones. So you can find images very, very quickly through visual search because the machines look at, see, tag and understand what they see. And indeed, the analogy of this can, can be seen in many other fields where uh, uh, machine learning and, and intelligence systems are sensing their environments. So not just visually, but actually listening to the world at work. So we have uh, very ex interesting examples of predictive maintenance where machines can now listen to machines, hear the change in tone that a turbine might go through or a jet engine or some aspect of production line manufacturing and can anticipate by the shift in that tone the fact that it might be failing quite soon. And this sensing of data goes well beyond looking at things and listening to machines, but of course listening to us. We have the ability of um, computers and smart systems now to engage in conversations, whether it's Siri, whether it's OK Google, whether it's Alexa or other systems uh, we can talk to, make inquiries of and be responded to in a conversational interface another set of data coming in, informing, if you like, the shape and decision making. Uh, on top of that, we also have the, the smart system's ability to pick up weak signals in noise, but weak signals that have real uh, interpretive power. Uh, uh, whether, as I pointed out a little bit earlier, it's to pick up uh, those little noises that will predict where machines fail. But likewise, if there's a huge flow of data, and this might be business information data or marketing data or, or information um, on um, the way that stock prices are trending, those weak signals can indeed predict and anticipate significant uh, uh, events and the ability to make sense of data to seek out and sniff out and find correlations that as humans we're finding really quite difficult to do or require considerable amount of analysis is again enabling these smart systems to sense, identify, react to and either um, make decisions or inform or shape or advise other decision makers. And these are being powered, as I say, by, by sensors, by, by uh, remarkable advances in computing power, in the hardware and software that goes with that. And last but not least, um, in, in the extraordinary amount of investment that is now being made to translate um, machine uh, research, artificial intelligence research, into very practical applications with venture capital and private equity and large corporations uh, backing startups, uh, setting up in-house development teams 
um, and um, seeking to find ways to address problems which may not have been easy to solve before, but which are quite straightforward to solve today, or to find ways of augmenting products and services and ways of interacting with, with their consumers uh, that are more efficient, more responsive. Um, and for the point of view of the employer um, and, and those who work in the organizations, there is a real opportunity if businesses want to take advantage of that to take out the boring, the dangerous and the repetitive and uninteresting in, in the world of work, hand it over to these smart systems and free people up to do the things that are most human, whether it's about building relationships, whether it's about being creative, um, or, or whether it, it is really around taking um, uh, the, um, the insights that are being generated um, uh, through augmented intelligence and creating new and novel things for the benefit of many. That, of course, though, Marco, is the slightly utopian perspective. And you will know, and I suspect most of the people who are listening to this will know, that there are two very different voices predicting two very different futures ahead of us. And the loudest voices belong to the dystopians, the, the people who say that the robots are going to come and take away our jobs, that the future of humanity is at risk, that power and wealth based so much as it is on data and who owns data, is going to migrate to an even fewer number of people, and that we will have deep social and political consequences of all of this. And we have the other voices, which are the bright voices, who say, well, this is liberating because actually we have spent the last decades turning jobs and people in jobs into robots anyway. We have broken jobs down into robotic activities. We have made work uninteresting, uh, people work too long. Here's an opportunity to enrich the world of work, to enable people to get deeper satisfaction out of what they do, perhaps to not work so long, and to create a whole raft of new jobs, new professions that we can't yet imagine, in the way that every industrial revolution up until this one, which as you know has been called Industrial Revolution 4.0, um, uh, will do. Uh, and what is, I think, absolutely true at the moment is that we don't know whether one or the other will yeah. become the dominant future. Right. Um, if I am a pragmatic optimist, I think that we will see both, but we're more likely to see the more optimistic future than we have the pessimistic, pessimistic one. But there is no doubt that virtually every job that you can imagine, that I can imagine, uh, every industry, every company is going to be touched one way or the other. Whether they make informed and committed decisions or whether the environment, the business and the commercial and the competitive environment in which they work is going to be changed by this. And this, of course, at last takes me to answer your question, Marco, and I'm sorry about that. Because what's this mean for executive education? Um, um, uh, the environment in, in, in which those who are either enrolled in, in your programs or will be your future participants is changing rapidly. The nature of leadership and the challenges facing leadership are, are, are changing. The strategic environment and, and, and how you engage and navigate your way through that is changing. The skills and capabilities and mindsets that are required to be successful in that future are almost certainly going to be a variation, if not completely different, to the ones that we have today. And hand in hand with that, of course, is that the very, very technologies that we are talking about themselves can infiltrate and be built into the way in which you deliver uh, learning and the way in which your own student bodies experience their engagement with you. Um, these are things that, that we covered in the last Unicorn conference, and, and there was a great opportunity for me, and I appreciated that, to raise some of those issues and great debate around the tables. But uh, it's not just the environment that, that is shifting, it's the nature of roles that is shifting, it's the, the way in which um, work gets done is, is shifting, uh, it's the pace at which learning needs to take place. Um, and it is often... And I think this is the challenge in executive education, trying to second guess 
prepare today for a world that doesn't quite yet exist. Those high potential um, individuals who are going to move up and grow and become influential in this new environment. Right, and, and, and now that you just mentioned that, uh, Anton, um, speaking for myself and being someone that is related to the, to the learning and, 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 and executive development uh, uh, sector, as, 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 mo as most of the people that are watching this, this webinar are, uh, when, I, when I hear uh, concepts like, it, it, it is about identifying behaviors, it is about identifying patterns, it is about watching, it is about listening to us on an individual but on a group basis, identifying trends. The, the, the two things that come to my mind are, first of all, this is going to change the way leaders are developed because, because what is going to happen in the organizations is that, uh, the, as, you, as you described it, jobs are changing, functions are changing, value propositions of the organizations are changing. So when we, if we claim to be developing executives, educating executives, developing leaders, we have to be aware of this. So it is about, it is about the what. But the second part that comes to my mind is also not only on the, on the, on the what, what is relevant for those leaders to be developed, but also how am I going to, 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 to transfer such knowledge, such capabilities, such competencies, whatever I want to develop on those, those leaders. My point is, it is not only about the what, but it is also about the how. And it is what, I know that, that artificial intelligence is going to have an impact on the, on the education world because you can use all of these technologies on the, on the learning process. So I would like to hear your thoughts on the, on, on, on the what, but also, but also on the how. Sorry to cover both things at the same time, but I think you cannot see yeah. one without talking about the other. Okay. Um, let, let me try to, to, to focus on the what for a minute, and then I'll go on, on to the how. Uh, so if you think about what um, executives will need to be doing, say, in the next three to five years, and then what they need to do beyond that. Um, I think if, if you are an executive in a small startup, um, this, this, this is one of the most exciting times because these technologies enable you to reinvent the... So, uh, let, let, let me answer this uh, by uh, focusing on, 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 on the what's just for a minute or two and then some of the how's. I think the what's are very interesting because I think that the executives, depending on the sorts of business they are, have had got some very exciting but actually very important decisions to, to, to focus on and change management processes to, to, to lead in the next few years. Um, if you are... Um, uh, a senior executive, a founder, a CTO, uh, an investor in or part of the startup team in, in a small business that, that is building artificial intelligence and machine learning to disrupt industries. And we are seeing these emerging right, left and center, uh, whether they are um, machine learning and artificial intelligence driven um, insurance company like Lollipop, um, wh whether they are um, uh, creating um, uh, services that were once delivered and owned only by a professional such as lawyers or accountants or financial advisors. Um, uh, so we have artificial intelligence lawyers being, being providing services to the, to the public. Um, where, where you have got these startups there, the entrepreneurial journey, the, the opportunity to seize the moment, the, the ability to disrupt build a brand rapidly and take it to market is both exciting, challenging, and actually there is, of course, a whole range of things they need to be able to get right because you can't be an amateur in that space. So there's an interesting series of what's. Now you return to the established businesses. How do they respond to these disruptions? How do they respond to that? If you are leading and running an insurance company that employs 30, 40, 50,000 people, uh, 20,000 of whom are in a call center, and your competitor has 70 people, none of whom are in a call center, 
none of the whom are, are claims handlers. They have no actuaries because all of this is done by smart machines. How do you change your organization? How do you respond to it? How do you reposition your offer to, to, to emphasize the human? How do you drive efficiencies in a way that utilize some of these technologies but can't copy the others? How do you manage the transition from a 30,000 uh, employee organization to maybe a 12,000 employee organization with the right people and the right mix over five or, or seven years? That presents another set of what challenges. And then it takes us to the how which is uh, how do you adapt? How do you find the right people? Uh, how do you plot your own career when your own future uh, may now be blocked by a very smart system that's doing your boss's job? Uh, someone said to me not, not long ago that um, uh, virtually every professional, uh, whether they are a, a, a training to be a lawyer, whether they're trained to be a doctor, whether they're trained to be an accountant, are going to find that just above them in those early years of, of professional development, there are already systems in place or will be smart systems in place that are doing the jobs that their predecessors would have done with um, artificial intelligence audit, uh, with artificial intelligence looking at document discovery in, in, in law, with artificial intelligence doing medical diagnostics. So there are challenges ahead in terms of how we manage our careers, what future careers look like, and how we adapt continually to these new environments. And so the things that I'm sure you and your colleagues in Unicom are focusing on on the how, which is learning agility, curiosity, uh, the, the, um, the, the ability to, to make use, if you like, of, of information that is provided for you perhaps in real time, uh, real time learning, bite sized learning. Um, uh, curiosity about, about the world are the things that I think are going to enable people to, to both uh, navigate their way through, build some resilience to, in a sense, those the blocks in expectations that you may end up where you want to be in 10 or 15 years time, but the route to get there may be entirely different to the one that your colleagues who have been down that road only five or 10 years before took. And then of course, in, in terms of the how and then the adaptability, there, there is the wonderful opportunity on the one hand or the scary opportunity on the other, which is that you might end up uh, having to do something that you've never done before in jobs or industries that never existed before. Uh, and I think there is an attitude of mind um, that, that, that will lead some to seek to withdraw from that, to be scared of it, to retrench, to stick with what they know they can do and what they're good at, but which may become less valued in the future, where there may be less demand for that. And for others, there will be an extraordinary opportunity to create oppor uh, work, to add value, to um, connect to this ecosystem in ways that are difficult to imagine today, but which will be commonplace in the future. And if I just give one or two examples of jobs that didn't exist even 15 or 20 years ago, of which we have many, who ever thought that the world would be full of web designers right. and, and user experience designers? It wasn't so long ago, maybe for you and for me, uh, when the internet didn't exist. So 100,000 web designers was beyond our imagining, and maybe it's a million. Uh, and, and we can take almost any one of these technologies, um, uh, whether it's a way in which the music industry has been transformed by, by giving to every young teenager in their bedroom the technology that only once existed in the most expensive recording studios. Right. Uh, and the same thing is happening with AI. Um, uh, much of the technology in terms of software is being open sourced. Um, uh, Google and Amazon and others are open sourcing a lot of their APIs. You can buy for $10 a little computer, uh, whether it's an Arduino or whether it's a Raspberry Pi, and you can connect it to a camera and you can connect to these API, APIs and you can build artificial intelligence systems in your bedroom to keep that analogy or in your shed or in the incubator in your business. 
the barriers to entry are no longer those of technology. They're no longer of computing power because it's up in the cloud. It's actually the skill set. And it's no great surprise, therefore, that one of the key skills in demand are the data scientists and then the machine learning experts, um, of whom there are not enough. And so, again, because my mind is going like this, to take us into education, we have got the incursion all of a sudden of large-scale learning through organizations like Coursera, Udacity, MOOCs that are coming in. And we must remember that Coursera and, and Andrew Ng, who set that up, was initially set up with one purpose in mind, which was to teach the world how to become programmers in artificial intelligence. Right. In the first year, 1.8 million people were certified, and he's just learned that, that phase two uh, of, of the program with the goal to, to train another million people or so. And of course, uh, Coursera now delivers many more than that. So uh, we have the upskilling of individuals. We have the self-driven opportunities that people have to, to learn these skills. And, and we have that openness to learning, which I think is going to differentiate those who will succeed from those who won't. And the openness to questioning and challenging and navigating your way through the reinvention of your own organization, which is going to define what leaders do differently and successfully in the future. Right. Uh, uh, and that is, that is really interesting for me, uh, Anton, because Again, what I hear you, uh, the very first conclusion that I come up with is this is a must in terms of uh, 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 um, what is relevant on leaders to be developed. So it is, it is, if, if I claim, uh, again, as an institution to be on the executive development field, it is a must to have this, to be aware of this topic. It is, it is, it is, it is no longer an added value, it is a requisite. Uh, having said that, the first thing is, do I have the, the, the capabilities in terms of the, of the experts inside my institution that are, that are going to, to be able to talk about this? Because the industry is changing quite fast. So that is the first thing. But the second one, and I will take your example with Coursera uh, 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 or, or, or Udacity or EDX, uh, just to mention a few. Uh, when we talk about developing leaders, Something that is being uh, widely discussed in the in the learning industry, especially in executive development, is that there are some things that can be developed by 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 looking at videos, by having some uh, reading assignments, by having this uh, uh, um, peer review uh, under which Coursera works and things like that. But there are some other things that need to be done on a face-to-face -face basis. At least that is what some of us say, because it's, it's, it is about having conversations, sharing expertise, uh, having these sort of interactions, sharing experiences. Uh, but at the same time, it's not about, maybe it's no longer about having a group of 20, 25 people, sitting all of them together in a single room, uh, trying to have the same topics discussed in between all of them, because each one of these individuals is different. And these technologies allow me to know each of those individuals their profiles, where they come from, where they want to head in the future, what industries they are working at. So it presents a new field under which the, 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 the institutions and the business schools need, need to be uh, not only competing, but developing a new value proposition. So what will be your, your advice uh, for this business school, for these universities, in terms of how to how to go into this field, again, in terms of the what and the how, because a lot of things are changing, and and, and the future, it is it is going to change for sure. But how to adapt and how to be on track with it? Yeah. First thing, I want to just say how much I I agree with everything you've just said, um, because. Uh, I have always recognized, and, and my colleagues in, in, in this field have always recognized, that experiential learning is a vital component, particularly in, in the way that, that, that you were describing. I, I think the, I, let me just reflect on, on my, my own experiences. I, I might talk with passion, I might talk as if I really know what I'm talking about, but the, the my background is not as a technologist. My, my, my insights and, and the degree to which I, I, I can connect to this are based on um, 
just widespread reading and talking to, to people. I don't think it is that difficult in a general sense to actually understand the trends, the issues, the dynamics, the, the, the uh, impact that these have on, on the world work. Um, uh, if you sat down and I think you and all your colleagues in all the business schools, if you read some of the news feeds that, that I read, actually some of the links that I, I provided in my presentation to you, I think virtually every one of your colleagues could speak with personal credibility after four to six weeks of immersion in this. As a consequence of that, um, I think you need to understand that there's a difference between being technically competent, you don't need to, to be able to program at the deepest level of machine learning to help organizations understand their impact. Uh, you don't need to be a deep data analyst um, to be able to work with, um, say, people in marketing or operations um, or logistics um, to help them truly understand both the consequences of this, the nature of the decisions they, they, they have to uh, embark on. Um, and I think you can also be, um, guides and signposts to emerging practical experience. You will have either in your alumni, uh, in your current customer set, or in those who are closely aligned as organizations to, 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 your, to your universities, people who are already having pragmatic experience. If you can bring together those who have started the journey of incorporation, uh, though those who are part of um, innovation engines who, who are driving this either because they're starting up as alumni um, businesses that are driven by machine learning or because they're experimenting or embedding these in, in their services so I think if you can bring people together if you can perhaps help them become sufficiently educated to understand the consequences if you get them to know and understand uh, that the difference between the, the deep reality of, of these things and the hype that they read about or salespeople will, will push them that's there so they can make informed business decisions. If you can help them incorporate everything they know or they will be learning about how you manage change, how you um, allocate capital expenditure in a way that is right for your own organization, how you bring people with you, how you build and reshape the capabilities. A lot of those are the classic things that you and, and your colleagues in Unicom have been remarkably good at. So it's not about reinventing everything that you do, but it's about how you infiltrate, how you incorporate, and, and how you reframe some of those in the shape of the future that we can already predict. Um, and it, I don't think it is about discarding so much of what you're good at. It's about how you, how you adapt, how you color, how you inform, um, and, and to keep on doing the things that you do most valuably. So you need to know yourselves, you need to understand your value proposition, you need to understand how you're differentiated from those, those, those mass distribution of, 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 uh, of learning on the one hand. And I suppose the one other thing that, that, that is key is that, that uh, it's, and I think this has been quite clear for a little while, but, but the, the smart systems put this into perspective there. Uh, we will never be able to learn read as rapidly and remember as accurately uh, all of the body of informa information that these smart systems can do. And, and therefore, the future of our alumni and our graduates is not based on how expert they are and how they can prove to the world that they know in a way that others don't. Expertise and deep knowledge is not going to be the differentiator. Uh, it is going to be those softer skills, it is going to be the how, and it's actually going to be the way in which uh, human and, and, uh, and your alumni's minds and brains collaborate with these smarts. And um, we, I think, are, are talking, therefore, of, about, uh, on the one hand, um, diminishing, if you like, the status that we give to experts in the field, uh, and raising the status of, of those who, who have the most human of qualities, those who can build collaborative uh, teams, uh, those who can sense and see opportunities, those who can demonstrate leadership, those who are good contributors to other people's projects and programs, those who are open and innovative, those who care for um, and can relate to the needs of others and build relationships in the ways that they can and not worry too much that there is 
a little box somewhere that is smarter than you in terms of the amount of data that it can recollect because humanity will be smarter than those boxes for many many years to come uh, I, I, I think this is this is this is uh, I, I just got to stop uh, Anton and this is really really interesting I just got to stop with this uh, uh, statement that you shared uh, when you said the challenge for universities for institutions for business schools is about how you incorporate how you reframe how you adapt whatever that you are doing right now as a, as, a, 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 as an institution to develop executives and to develop new leaders under these new uh, changes and all of these opportunities and challenges that artificial intelligence is is uh, is putting on the table and uh, you also mentioned it it is it is about knowing yourselves and knowing how to transition my 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 my, my conclusion my first conclusion would be how do i complement or enrich my value proposition while keeping my identity not only as a business school not only as an institution or as a university but whatever makes me unique as an institution on, uh, 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 and uh, this complemented with these new opportunities that that artificial intelligence and all of these new technologies bring bring on the table uh, 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 my complementary uh, uh, question and, and uh, in this sense uh, would be what are the challenges or what would be the risks if we don't fall into that in the short term uh, is it something that must be done by uh, institutions developing leaders developing executives uh, is there like a huge risk if we don't get into this what what are what is the trade-off in between uh, getting too fast or being a little more cautious, uh, cautious or careful while getting into this new trend um, uh, it's, a, it's a good question it's a remarkably good question it's not one that I can necessarily answer well because I don't live in your world uh, but I, I think the, the, the challenge is to avoid addressing this by creating one or two bolt-on courses which are called um, strategic leadership in the artificial intelligent world or entrepreneurial um, uh, uh, becoming an AI entrepreneur uh, and putting it in a little box or connecting it. I, I think you have already raised, and I think it's the point that I hope to get across, that it doesn't matter what you teach. It doesn't matter whether you're, uh, whether you're teaching about an industry or, or about strategic thinking or, or about human resources or about organ perhaps the only thing that doesn't change is organizational behavior. But, but, but every stream of, of the work that you do um, every um, scenario that you create that people learn within, um, every economic, macroeconomic analysis that you do has to understand that this infiltrates that. It's not a brilliant four day or six day or six week program on artificial intelligence and everything else stays the same. Uh, because if you don't get it as an institution, others will. I mean, th I think this is inevitably the way it's going to go. And actually, and some of those people will not be your standard competitors. Uh, someone said to me the other day, and I think this is both frightening and probably realistic. They say, wait until Amazon gets into the education business. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe that won't happen. But you know and you've seen that actually only this week, Amazon has got into the health industry business. Yes. Amazon will disrupt higher education. Um, you, and if not them, someone remarkably like them, like Google. Or, or So what's the window of opportunity that you have? How long do you have to reinvent what you're doing in not the catastrophic way, but in the necessary way that we're talking about. Um, uh, how do you, and I love the way in which you were describing it, Marco, keep the essence of, of your institution, which is absolutely vital. Your history, your ethos, everything your faculty represents, 
um, the uh, quality and nature and, and, and essence of your alumni networks and maintain it through this there, but how do you adapt at the pace that is required and the breadth and depth that is required to keep up with a world that actually for many of us is quite challenging to keep up with anyway. Great. I, I, I think I think I think that is that is that is a, a, a great way to, to summarize some of some of these ideas. I was just writing some of this and and, and, and my personal my personal summary of, of these ideas uh, 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 would be if, if we don't do it, others may will wait until these big disruptive players like Amazon may get into the, the education or learning industry just like Amazon just did with the health. Uh, industry, there is this window opportunity uh, that we have as institutions, how to enrich or reinvent whatever we are doing right now, while at the same time we are keeping the essence. And I think that that is a really strong and also very useful message for all of, uh, for all of our Unicorn members. Uh, we are almost running out of time, Anton. Uh, the, the conversation is really, really interesting. But is, if there is any, any, any thought or any final piece of advice that you would like to share with all of our Unicorn members, uh, 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 please feel free to do so. Um, I, I won't actually, um, partly because as you can see, I can talk too, too much and, and, and too long, but partly because um, but this is changing so quickly that all, all I would say is just keep reading. Uh, find one or two new sources, <coughs> feeds, um, um, trusted sources that, that enable you to keep up to date with what is going on against a broad spectrum and it is intoxicating um, it is both fascinating it is exciting it is frightening it is intellectually stimulating um, it challenges so many of the, the assumptions many of us have made about the near future these things are not science fiction anymore and and i would say that i um because I have to again second guess. I, I guess that most of the people involved in your business schools, most of the people involved in putting together these programs have that curiosity themselves, are, are interested, and, and, and just don't be frightened of it. So read, explore, talk to others, play with ideas, experiment yourself with, with, with alternative ways of doing it, bring your alumni or, or, or co-invent with your own students programs that, that are relevant for you. Talk to, to your executive education clients as corporations. Understand what they're doing. Maybe go on a little bit of walkabout. Um, maybe be immersed yourself in their innovation centers. Uh, spend a little bit of time with startups. And I can guarantee if it's not three or four weeks in, it's three or four months in, you will have a degree of insight into what you can do, what the opportunities are. And it's not going to be that difficult. Um, I may be proved wrong, but my real sense is that this is going to stimulate ideas. It's going to stimulate creativity. It's going to open up avenues. It's going to make the experience of learning in organizations uh, more relevant to the people coming through. And it's an opportunity, I think, for you to build stronger connections to your clients as businesses and organizations than you've ever been able to do before if only you can connect to a shared agenda, which I think this enables you to do. Great, thank you. I, I think that is a, a, a really nice way to, to, to finish up this conversation, Anton. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for sharing all of these uh, ideas, all of these uh, thoughts uh, on behalf of uh, all of our Unicorn members. I really thank you for this, for this interview. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And uh, to all of you that uh, watch this uh, interview, uh, we, we, we will be glad to share uh, Anton contact information in case you are, you are interested in, in, in making any contact with him. Recall as well that our upcoming uh, director's conference in Norway is precisely going to touch uh, topics like artificial intelligence. So uh, we are uh, very glad to share all of these ideas with you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Anton. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.